World Denver talks today with former Assistant Secretary of Defense Lawrence Korb. Dr. Korb is an expert on the defense budget and is a senior fellow with the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. Welcome back to Denver, Dr. Korb. Nice to be back again. Let's start with a historical perspective. Is the defense budget the largest that it's ever been in U.S. history? In 2010, when you count the regular budget <clears throat> and the what we call the war funding, which came on top of the regular uh, regular budget, even if you control for inflation, it was higher than at any time since World War II. We've never rivaled that, but we've spent more in 2010 than we did at the height of Vietnam, which was 1968, or the height of Korea, which was uh, 1953. And I was in the, the Reagan administration, and of course we didn't have a war, but the base budget topped out at about $540 billion. If you look at the base budget in 2010, exclusive of the war funding, it, it was again controlling inflation, it was about 550. What about that separate war budget? I mean the direct costs of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are approaching $2 trillion. But that's the direct cost. Now, the indirect cost, for example, veterans' benefits, the fact that you had to borrow money in order to, uh, you know, to fight them. Because it was the first significant conflicts in our history where we've never not raised taxes to pay for them. In fact, we cut taxes. So you basically had to borrow the money to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to fight the wars. And the bill will continue to come due for, for generations to come as uh, those young men and young women uh, who were physically, mentally uh, uh, wounded uh, there uh, continue to need our care. And what about a global perspective? Has the, has the U.S. always been the largest spender on defense? Well, in fact, if you go back and you take a look at in, in the turn of the century, uh, this, this century, the United States accounted for one-third of the world's military expenditures, one-third of the world's gross domestic product. By 2010, we were half the world's military expenditures, but only 20 percent of the world's uh, economic uh, output. Now, we're cutting back uh, not just the war funding, but the uh, base budget as a result of the Budget Control Act and this process known as sequestration. Uh, basically, that will bring us back to, quote unquote, only 40 percent of the world's military expenditures. During the Cold War, it was very hard to figure out the real cost of the Soviet budget because they had a command economy and, 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 and everything. But it was pretty, they probably were spending a little bit more on defense than we were during the Cold War. And one of the reasons was President Eisenhower decided that we did not want to match them dollar for dollar or tank for tank, but you would prevail in the Cold War with a more vibrant economy. And what happened is the Soviets strangled their economy by devoting so much of their capital, uh, both fiscal and brain capital, to, uh, to, uh, to the so-called Cold War. One of your jobs um, along the way at Defense Department was to negotiate for other countries to pay their fair share. We have bases, you know, for example. A lot of bases in Europe have Japan, uh, Korea. And what I would do is tell those countries that they ought to help us defer the cost of keeping those men and women there. I mean, we all experience terrorism. I mean, all of our airports and, you know, all of our citizens need to be protected. Um, why shouldn't other countries pay a greater share of that burden? Well, I think if you take a look at the situation in Libya, we did. I mean, unlike Iraq, where we never really got UN authorization or support from our allies, we pretty much did that on ourselves. Some countries did, uh, did, did contribute. It was really an American operation. But if you look at Libya, and I think President Obama, to his credit, said, wait a second, Gaddafi is horrible. We'd like him to go, but he's not as that direct a threat to us is also a threat to you. And so, in effect, what happened is the United States provided its capabilities, like it fired cruise missiles, it had drones to do intelligence, uh, refueled the planes, particularly of our allies from, uh, from France, Britain, and, uh, and Italy. And, you know, that war to get rid of Gaddafi cost us about a billion dollars cost us over a trillion to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Mm. So that's the way to go. And I think now as you take a look at Syria, I think President Obama is quite correctly saying, well, wait a second, this is not just an American concern. A lot of people should be concerned. And you know, if you really want the good model about how to fight a war when you don't have an existential threat like the Soviet Union, the first President Bush in the first Gulf War, 
we got 250,000 troops from other nations. And those that didn't or couldn't because of their constitutions or political uh, process couldn't send troops actually sent money. And if you take a look at Syria, we're not the only, we're providing non-lethal uh, lethal aid. You've got a lot of the uh, countries uh, in the region, the Saudis, for example, are providing uh, help to the, uh, uh, to the rebels. And so, I mean, I think that's, and if we should decide that we want to get more involved militarily, I think we ought to get contributions. I mean, the French were the ones who created this mess when they set up Syria, you know, after, after World War I. So national security is just not military power. It's also uh, soft power or diplomat, diplomatic power. And we've taken a look and we said, all right, let's take the money that the government spends on the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, and Development, or the State Department. Could we make some trade-offs there that would really enhance our security? Because, you see, the State Department and the development doesn't have a constituency in this country. So it's very, very hard. And I think Secretary Gates was saying, you know, we ought to put more money into the state because if state, for example, AID doesn't have enough people to do uh, development in an area, and we have the military there, they'll do it. But where I disagree with him, and I pointed out in that, in, in that article, he doesn't want to take it from defense. He just wants to ha add it on. I say, no, I've taken a look, and we've done this under the Bush administration, now under Obama. You tell us how much you want to spend on all three and we will tell you how to spend it differently. Let me give you an example where I think, and it, it, it's not just you know a, a soft power. The Coast Guard is in the Department of Homeland Security. There are 21 other agencies there. It gets lost. Its total budget is less than the Defense Department spends on one program called Missile Defense. Now, if you're worried about somebody, you know, getting a nuclear attack on the United States, are they gonna shoot a missile with a return address or try and smuggle it in? Unlikely to shoot it because then you could retaliate with our 5,000 weapons, try and smuggle it in. That's the Coast Guard's job. But they're, they're not getting the money. And, and how much more do you think the State Department and AID ought to be spending? Well, I think that the State Department should get at least $10 billion more than they have right now. And the real problem is, not only whatever they ask for gets cut, they shouldn't be even asking for more. And I think if you had a unified security budget, people couldn't say, well, let's, you know, get rid of this development aid, you know, it's wasted or, you know. I, and, and it's very hard to measure, you know, the impact, either the impact of that. Two, on 2001, in today's dollars, the base defense budget was 300 billion. By 2010, it was 700 and some billion dollars. Well, that's a very big increase in a short period of time. So what happens is you have a trouble program. You say, well, let's keep it going. We might be able to, uh, you know, to solve it uh, later, later on. Or, well, let's rush into production here, even though it's not ready to go into, into, into production. And so what happened is that we spent like $30 billion on weapons that we canceled. Okay, we've got nothing, you know, for it. You had cost overruns. I mean, John McCain, Senator McCain, is a strong supporter of national defense. I mean, he has given interviews, spoken on the floor of the Senate. He said, it's a scandal and a tragedy the way that we're managing our, our weapon systems. And uh, Secretary Hagel gave a speech at the National Defense University about three weeks ago. And he said, you know, when we've made the biggest progress is during downturns, because then you're forced to make the hard uh, choices. If you go back and take a look at the weapons we have today, uh, you know, you're talking about stealth aircraft, GPS, <clears throat> precision guided uh, weapons, uh, drones, and all of that type of thing. They were all started in the 70s when the defense budget went down drastically after, after Vietnam. As former Secretary of uh, Defense Harold Brown, who was Secretary of Defense under uh, President Carter, recently wrote in his book, he said, you know, we developed them. Reagan, when the budget went up, bought them, and then Bush got to use them. 